Well, good morning. How are you guys doing today? I heard a fantastic. Oh, great. I'm, I'm also well. I don't know if I'm fantastic, but I'm doing okay. Um, hey, good morning. Uh, do me a favor. Uh, if you have a Bible, open up to Acts chapter 4. That's where we're going to be, among other places. We're going to be bouncing all around the Gospels, and we're going to start with Acts. Um, I guess I should introduce myself because I haven't been here in a little bit. I don't know. Uh, my name's Bert. I, I, I'm one of the pastors. I preach here sometimes. Hi. Um, and uh, I'm excited to get to bring the word to you today. Um, we're going to just continue. So we, we've been going through the book of Acts as a church um, because we believe that the Lord has shaped our church identity as such that we are a church that believes in being rooted in the word and empowered by the spirit. In other words, we believe that as we read the scriptures, one of the things that the scriptures teach us is that we should expect what we see in them to happen in our lives. But what we don't want to do is be superstitious, and we don't want to just go, hey, listen, you know, there's all kinds of bad doctrines around the supernatural. We don't want to do that. We want to do what the Bible says. And so um, what we're doing is we're we're sort of slowly working through the book of Acts. We did 1 Corinthians last year, and now we're in the book of Acts to try and develop a good framework for uh, our expectations and, and, you know, how we believe that God moves. And so... uh, Acts is a great primer on this. And, and by the way, anything about Acts is Acts is the story of the church. It's the reason why uh, what God did through these apostles and these believers, it's not just apostles, what he did through them is the reason that you and I are Christians. Like the fact that he carried the message of the cross forward through them and how it went out into the world from Jerusalem. Like this is why the Christianity is not just a regional religion that's only in Israel. But instead, listen, we've picked this up as the Lord has entrusted us the gospel. And so if you're like, like, if nothing else, as we read this book, just go, oh, this is why we're here. This is how we got here. And so um, just sort of continuing in the story, uh, Pastor Josh absolutely crushed it the last couple of weeks. But if you're here uh, last week, one of the things that he talked about was how, okay, maybe, maybe you can identify with this, where Peter and John were persecuted for doing the right thing, right? Like they go and they're, they're walking into the, the temple and they see a guy who's a lame beggar. And Peter looks at him, remember, and he says, silver and gold have I none, but what I have I'll give to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Stand up and walk. And the guy walks. It's like, awesome. And immediately things go south, right? And so I'm sure you can't identify that word. You know, I did the right thing, and it always worked out so right for me, I'm sure, okay? But for them, no. Like, what happened was instantly they were persecuted by the very people who killed Jesus, remember? And so they're brought, like, in this power play, they're brought in front of the Sanhedrin. They're brought in front of the people who had, had given the permission for, for Christ to be killed. They had instigated that. And now they're basically standing for these same people. And they're like, okay, listen, explain to us what you did. And they tell them, listen, just don't preach in the name of Jesus anymore. Remember what happens, right? Peter, like, he stands forward and he goes, listen, we have to be obedient to God rather than men, right? Hey, we're not going to stop. Right, And so our story today picks up in the aftermath of that. So now they've been released from jail. They've been released from this, like the trial of their life. And what are they going to do? Okay, Because up until this moment, they've, they've had favor with everybody. Up until this moment, like everybody's been really nice towards the Christians. But now something's being to divide. And what happens in this story, I think, is good for us to understand as we walk forward in our faith as well. And so in Acts 4, starting in verse uh, 23, it says this. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Okay, so their response, by the way, I want you to just catch this. Their response to adverse circumstances is not to bemoan them, but to go to the Lord. How many of us, let's just, let's just chew on that for a second here. We're, okay, listen, something goes bad and my response is, God has forsaken me, Right? But instead, what they do is they go, hey, this is not an occasion to despair. This is an occasion to go to our Father in prayer. Well, I didn't mean for that to rhyme, but it did. Okay. All right. Like, that's the heart posture. And so they raise their voices in prayer to God. Here's what they pray. Sovereign Lord. What that phrase means is that God is in control. That nothing, nothing surprises God. He's immutable. He doesn't change. Like, that God's hand is everywhere. And so they're recognizing, hey, God, none of this surprises you. Sovereign Lord. They said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Here's what this prophecy was. Why do the nations rage and people's plot in vain? Why? Because nobody can thwart what God is doing. So basically, David looks at this time where people are they're trying to set themselves up against God, and he's like, it's pointless. The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and his anointed one. 
Indeed, verse 27, indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city, this city, the one that we're in, to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. But look at this, verse 28. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. In other words, I just want you to catch this. This is why I'm a sovereignty of God, guys. This is why I'm reformed in my theology, okay? Because here's what they're saying. God, even when the world did its worst against you, you not only anticipated it, you planned it. All right, so like when Herod and Pontius Pilate, like they decided, hey, we're going to kill Jesus. Okay, let's know. Accordingly, actually, what they did was like they were just going along with where you had been directing things to go. Now, I'd just like to bring this up because here's the good news for you and for me. This means the following, that, that tragedy, pain, hardship, we view these things as lapses in God's care for us. But according to this, no, actually, God's working something much greater than we could ask him for. Rest in that. There, if you're in Christ, there has never been a moment where God has forgotten about you. There has never been a moment where he's been surprised that he was like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? No, no. He's intentional towards you and me. That's what they're saying right here. Listen, like, okay, they planned this, but Father, you were working out our salvation in that moment. Because the worst that the world can do, it turns out God can actually redeem even that. And if he can redeem that, the greatest injustice in human history, how much do you want to bet he can redeem your pain and mine? Right? Okay. And so here's what they're saying. God, you're not surprised. Okay, we're terrified right now. And let's just be honest. They are terrified right now. But Father, you're not surprised. We are exactly where we should be. And they pray this weird thing. Like, that wasn't weird. No, that's not the weird one. Here's the weird thing. So they say this in verse 29. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. In other words, Father, even though we're scared, instead of us shutting down, instead of us being like, oh my gosh, we've got we to retreat into safety and security. Instead, Father, would you make us do the exact opposite? Okay, like they're, they're persecuting us for preaching your word. Let us preach it even more boldly. Like, come on, the guts in that. And so that, okay, and then they say this, verse 30, stretch out your hand to heal and to perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Now, here's why that's a weird prayer, okay? So just, just to, to backtrack, let us preach more boldly, let there be healing signs and wonders. Here's why that's weird, because they've already been doing all those things. I mean, listen, like the occasion for this story, it's not that like, like many of us, like we pray for the Lord to begin to heal because we haven't seen him be healing. Right? But that's not them. Like the occasion for the story is a lame guy literally is walking now. And leading in Acts 2, remember how it talks about, listen, like the Lord was continually doing signs and wonders uh, among the apostles. So it's weird that they're praying for that right now. Like what's the connection between, okay, like, Father, we're scared, so let us preach more and also heal. Like why is that there? And to understand it, We've got to do some legwork. So I'm going to Bible nerd out on, on you for a minute, okay? We're going to go all around the Gospels. If you get bored, listen, go ahead and, and fall asleep. I'll wake you up at the cool part, okay? Like, I'm, I'm just, please don't do that. I'll, I'll feel really self-conscious, but okay. So, all right, so, so here's to understand why they pray in the way that they do, that, okay, listen, let us preach boldly, but also, Father, stretch out your hand to heal the sick and to perform signs and wonders. To understand that, we have to understand this phrase right here, Kingdom of God. Kingdom of God. Because something that you have to know about Christianity is this, like, like how the apostles viewed it, how I think the, the true biblical reading of this movement is something like this. It's not a real, just a religious movement. It's about a kingdom. Okay, let, let me say, let, let, just understand, like we think of Christianity and we think it in this thing, okay, like that's a religion, one among many, right? Like, so we have a, a belief system, we have uh, different kinds of worship gatherings and what have you, and every now and then you see God do something. Okay, but they didn't view it this way. They didn't, like, like the, the, the apostles, they didn't believe they were starting a new religion. They believed they were being true to the Judaism that they had grown up with. But they had an understanding about, listen, okay, like a framework for the entire experience of being Christians that I don't know that we necessarily get. And it all falls under this idea of kingdom of God. So let me just run through some Bible with you real quick just so that we can get on the same page here. Okay, so way, way, way back at the beginning of humanity, there's this story in Genesis 1. I said, like, way back, right? Where God creates the heavens and the earth, you know? Creates everything, creates animals, create, creates plants. You know, that's what we need. 
And then at the end of it, like what he does is like, like as you read Genesis 1, it starts to crescendo, right? It starts with like formless stuff and then it goes towards life. And ultimately at the apex of all of it, God creates human beings. Right? Remember this story? And so, and so in Genesis 1, 26, it says this, like as God begins to differentiate what he's going to do through human beings, it says, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. So that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Now, now really quick, sometimes there's, there's some unnecessary debate on what it means to be made in the image of God. So let me just clarify how uh, an ancient Near Eastern uh, Jew would have understood this passage. Okay? Because to be made in the image of God has nothing to do with our intelligence or having a soul, although certainly those are byproducts of it. No, instead, when you read Genesis 1, you find it saying over and over again, and God said, and it was so. This is how kings talk in the ancient Near East. Like, king would say, all right, it will be like this, and the, and the kingdom would just move forward, and it would be that way, okay? And so when you're reading Genesis 1, the very first thing that the author wants you to understand is that God is the king of the universe. That, like, that's, that is the, like, before we get anywhere else, like, in terms of the nature of the world, God is king above all of it, all right? But then he does this thing where he says, listen, I'm going to create mankind in my image, meaning reflecting my nature. So what do they do? They are designed to rule over the earth. Right? Like, it's like, okay, like, if God is king, well, then what he entrusts to human beings is that they would be, like, sort of his, his, his royal representatives on the planet. And so that's this idea here. Like, let them rule over things. So it says this in verse 27. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish. There's that word again. Rule. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground and everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so, right? And so... Uh, God creates male and female, and they rule on the planet in his stead until you're going forward in the narrative. You discover something that, okay, while they're in the Garden of Eden, they're not the only ones there, are they? And there's this serpent that comes in, and he gets them to turn on God because he promises them something. Listen, like, uh, basically, he lies about God. God's holding out on you. Like, he's, they're, they're, he's got good things he doesn't want you to have. And by the way, how many people that's the root of sin for us, right? The, this inherent distrust of God. Okay, like, listen, if I do it God's way, <laughs> I'm going to miss the fun. Well, that's the root of sin right there. And so our first parents, Adam and Eve, they listened to the serpent, and they rebel against God. And here's what they did in doing that. Because, again, they were God's representatives in creation. Well, as a result, creation broke. And this is why going forward, you'll notice that like God, like these, these curses come about as, as a byproduct of the fall, right? That's what, what's called the fall, right? Like, okay, there's, there's going to be pain in childbirth. There's going to be like uh, toil and despair. There's, there's death. There's sin, right? But I want you to notice that God doesn't just stop with the, the consequences on the man and the woman. He also brings them to the serpent because they're in cahoots, right? Because in order, because here's, here's the thing that, that we sometimes miss is that, okay, when they rejected God's reign in creation, a power vacuum was created. And another kingdom came in. And it wasn't the kingdom of human beings at all. Well, who was it? Well, it was the devil. The demonic infused. I'm going to show you that to you, because I know that's not popular. But, but just... Understand something, that, okay, the reign, the kingdom of God was rejected within creation, and ever since then, God has been reconciling the world to himself in Christ. And so the things are handed over to the demonic, but here's the weird part. You might just notice this. Um, Satan is really quiet in the Old Testament. Have you noticed that? Like, he's barely in it. Okay, but, but, but let me I, I, see, I, know, I know the contention. The contention is, okay, like, well, you're telling me that the, the earth was handed over to the devil. Yes, I am. <laughs> Look, I'll give you some examples of this, okay? New Testament framework. Uh, the temptation of Jesus in Luke chapter 4. Here's what happens. It says, the devil led him, talking about Jesus, in verse 5, up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world, say the entireness of the earth and its splendor. And he said to them, I will give you all their authority and splendor. And look at this line. It's been given to me. It's been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be 
yours. And I want you to notice that in that moment, Jesus did not call him a liar. Right? There's no, like, actually, no, it's mine. No, actually, no, like, no, no. He's, Jesus kind of it's like, okay, there's a, something else here, right? But, but why has it been given to him? Because our first parents handed it over. And the kingdom of God was rejected. As a result, sin enters the world. Evil enters the world. Death enters the world. Sickness enters the world. The dead human soul, apart from the life and breath of the Holy Spirit, enters the world. We are born with sinful natures. We are born rebellious against God. It just infused into anything. And look, again, 1 John 5.19, here's, here's what John writes. He says, we know that we are the children of God, those who are in Christ, and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. Now, you don't believe that? Answer me something. Why is it, come on, how many people, why is it we enter, like, like we live in a world where everyone is really quick to give God all of the blame and none of the credit? Have you noticed that? Okay, like, I just can't believe in a loving God who would allow this. Okay, well, what about the breath that's in your lungs right now? Well, yeah, that's a, that's a fluke. Okay, but why are people naturally inclined away from the things of God? Because the world is under the domain of darkness. Let me be really, really clear here. There's no middle ground Christianity. It's either you're in Christ or you're an enemy of God. Like, that's biblical language. It's not, okay, I think Jesus is pretty nice. I'm not quite sure if he's Savior or not. Now, he might be wooing you to salvation in that, but at the end of the day, when you stand before God, it's not going to be, okay, listen, like, how good a person were you? It's, were you in my kingdom? Have you accepted the reign of Christ or have you not? And so you come to the New Testament, you come to the Gospels, in this world where the kingdom of God has been rejected, and again, like Satan's been really silent, but suddenly bursting onto the scene, there's this guy named John the Baptist. Remember, oh, actually, hang on. Let me give you one other instance here, okay? Because like, when I talk about the idea of Jesus showing up, like, I really want you to see this, okay? Like, because, again, we think it's this, this thing of like Jesus showed up to make converts. No, he came to redeem creation. This is why like, what's attributed to the, the breaking of it uh, is... The, the work of Satan. It's why in 1 John, again, in, in, in uh, 1 John uh, 3, 8, John says it like this. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. What's the devil's work? It's the fall. It's sin. It's evil. It's corruption. It's sickness. It's death. Like these things have been sown into creation. Okay, so you go uh, to the first century, all right, and Satan's been quiet through most of the Old Testament. And then like bursting out of nowhere, you have this prophet named John the Baptist. Remember him? He's in the intro of all the Gospels, right? And John, he, he, he invites people to come out into the wilderness and repent of their sin, turn from their sin. Why? Because sin goes against the very nature of a holy God. And do you remember what, like, the, the why that he gives, why he's inviting them to, to turn from darkness and turn to light? Here's what it says. Matthew 3, verses 1 2. In those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent. For the kingdom of heaven, this is interchangeable with kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven has come near. Now, he's not talking about heaven, the place that you go to when you die. He's not saying, hey, listen, everybody's about to die. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is the reign of God is about to enter into the earth. Like the way that God does things is about to break into creation. And so John keeps preaching this message every Sunday over and over again. Repent, the kingdom of God is here. Repent, repent. I, I, like we'd probably get bored with him, but he just keeps doing it. And then one day, Jesus is baptized, right? And after he's baptized, he goes out into the wilderness. He's tempted by the devil, and he comes back. And when he begins his ministry, when he begins to say, listen, this is what I'm here to do. Do you remember what he said? I'll tell you, Mark 1.15. He says, the time has come. He said, the kingdom of God has come near. Okay, and by come near, what he doesn't mean is, hey, it's going to be one day. In the sense of like, guys, if I'm standing next to you, you'd be like, okay, like, I, I'm near Hunter and Shannon. That's the idea. Like, like, hey, so what are you saying? When he says, the kingdom of God has come near. What he's saying is, hey, I'm the kingdom of God. Like the reign of God is present. I'm bringing it into creation. It's right here, okay? It's come here. Repent and believe. And look at this word right away. Uh, the good news. And we're going to come back to that, by the way. Um, because the word that we translate as, as good news right there is euangelion in the Greek. It's the same word that we translate gospel. And that's going to come back. Because many of us, we view the gospel only as a conversion thing. But we're wrong to do that. 
It's intrinsically linked to the redemption of creation. This is why, by the way, we call Jesus, Jesus Christ. What is Christ? Christos. It means king. Like all this, this is not about, okay, like I have a conversion moment and then I die one day and I go to be with Jesus. No, this is about the redemption of creation post fall. Okay, so Jesus, the kingdom of God is, has come near. And what does he immediately do? He calls disciples, right, from death to life, come and follow me. So he begins to redeem the sinner. And then he begins to undo the works of Satan in the fall. So Matthew 4, 23, here's, I mean, right at the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. It says, Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom or gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and sickness among the people. Why? Because these things are in the world because of the brokenness of the fall. They were not God's design for creation. And so like a master repairman or mechanic, he's in there, he's just fixing it. Sometimes what happens is people, they, they view the, the miraculous accounts of the gospel almost like, Jesus, almost like Jesus is doing street magic. And they completely miss the point. And actually what he's doing is undoing the fall. Again, like, like Luke's account of the Gospels begins the same way. After Jesus comes back from, from the temptation, what's it say? In Luke 4, starting verse 40, At sunset, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sickness. And laying his hands on each one, he healed them. Moreover, demons came out of many people, shouting, You are the Son of God! But he rebuked them, would not allow them to speak, because they knew he was the Messiah. Verse 42, at daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place. The people were looking for him, and when they came where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving. But look at this, verse 43, but he said, I must proclaim the, and there's our word again, good news of the kingdom of God, gospel, euangelion, to the other towns also, because that is why I was sent. Okay, so what is the good news? The good news is that the kingdom of God has come in Christ. So it's called an already not yet kingdom, okay? The kingdom, like the reign of God has entered into the world through Jesus and he has begun the process of redeeming the brokenness of humanity, saving us from our sins, healing us, delivering us. And I'm, and I'm like, dang, Bert, like this is kind of a ritual. It's actually not. Like I'm, I'm stealing from all kinds of people like uh, John Wimber, uh, my friend uh, Michael Miller, uh, a guy named uh, Dustin Gerald. There's, there's, there's a lot of people that I'm ripping this off of. I just want to not plagiarize, so let me just get that out there. Um, but I want you to notice this idea that um, the gospel and the kingdom is linked not just to the salvation of the soul, but the redemption of the earth. Okay, I mean, I, I can continue. Matthew 12, 28, when Jesus is challenged, here's what he says. But if it is by the spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Okay, so why does Jesus heal? Well, he heals because he... Because the, the sickness and the death are evidence of the fall. Why does he redeem the sinner? Because sin is evidence of a rebellion against God. He's beginning to save the person. God in his mercy does this. Why does he raise the dead? Because death is a result of the fall. And over and over again, what he's saying is, listen, I'm the king of the kingdom. Hear me, turn to me, and be saved from your evil. And so we continue, all right? So what happens is this, and this is where it gets really, really neat, okay? Um, so Jesus does all this stuff, and you're like, cool, that's great. But then he doesn't, keep it to himself. He begins to commission his followers to do it. Did you know that? So like, like, I'll give you an example. So in Matthew uh, 10, he sends out the 12 apostles to different towns surrounding, and here's what he tells them to do. Okay? As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Okay, what's that look like? Verse 8, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received freely give. And you're like, okay, cool. So he goes out there and he starts telling his followers, like the 12 apostles, you guys go start doing what I've been doing. And now it's that the kingdom's here. All right. But then he doesn't stop with the 12 apostles. Then he just, just one day he just grabs 72 random followers who, as far as we can tell, have no authority in the church. They're not like they're not church leaders. They're just random believers. Okay. And that's what he does in Luke uh, 10. Like he tells them the same, like the same thing in Luke 10 verse 9. He tells them, heal the sick who are there and tell them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. I'm bringing this up because we've got to change our framework for how we expect God to act. Many of us think that like the kingdom of God is simply the salvation of the soul. It is, and yet there's so much more. Okay? It's not just me talking. 
Like it's not just a faith invitation, although that's certainly part of it. It's a beautiful part of it. It's the greatest miracle that, that there is. It's just that we expect the supernatural to be the exception, not the norm, and we're wrong to do that. This is why Paul, like years later, can reflect on the very nature of what God is doing through believers. And in 1 Corinthians 4.20, he says, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. Hey, the kingdom of God is not just we say, and we, like, like we, we, we ascribe to this sort of moral therapeutic deism, which is okay, like, like we don't really expect God to interact at all, and we're just gonna, we just want to hear a good lesson to help us figure out how to be a better person. That's not Christianity. Christianity is the kingdom of God is here in Christ. And power is here because Jesus is power. Because he's given us authority to do the very works that he did. Okay, so why, why do I keep bringing this? Okay, well, so back to Acts 4. You're like, dang, that was all about Acts 4? Yeah. <laughs> Stay with me. So look at their prayer again. Okay, so they're terrified. And so they say in verse 29, Now, Lord, consider their threats. And enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Okay, really quick. I, I just, um, just a spoiler for the end of the talk. Uh, when, when we're done, if you've got any physical affliction, um, I want to pray for you over here and ask the Lord to heal you. But also, uh, for the ones who are sitting here today, um, so that you understand that, like, Satan doesn't just live in Africa. One of the ways that you've just been attacked demonically is something you just hated me for no reason. And you're not even sure why. I would love to pray for you so that, that God would just free you from that shackle. That like like this sort of I'm not, like like I mean you, you've just felt it in you. Ah, you don't even know like oh this is all lies. Well, no, it, it's not. And the enemy is fighting hard against what the Holy Spirit's doing in your heart right now. I'd love to pray for you too. Okay, so look. So again, uh, enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Verse 30, stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Okay, so why is this linked between the proclamation of the name of Jesus and signs and wonders and, and miracles? Um, because there's no divide. Like the, reason, like, like the reason they pray this is because they're, they're praying the same thing. Lord, let us continue to proclaim the kingdom. We're afraid, but this doesn't surprise you. Let us speak more with more boldness. In, in other words, um, here's the thing to understand, and if you're taking notes, write this down. Um, in the minds of early Christians, there was no distinction between demonstrations of God's power and the message of the gospel. They, they just did, like, we do that. We divide it. Like, we think, okay, like there's, there's, there's regular gifts and there's supernatural gifts. Regular gifts, there's healing. And then, I mean, regular gifts, there, there, there's teaching and there, there's administration. And then there's supernatural, like, healing, miracles, tongues. And we're wrong to divide it. Like, the scripture does not divide them this way. Like, to them, it's really, really simple. If you believe that the kingdom has come in Christ, then buckle up because you're going to see the power of God. Like that, that's, that's the understanding here. They are one in the same. Now, really quick, because I don't want you to think I'm trying to develop an unhealthy theology of healing. Um, what I am not saying is that there won't be times where God, in his sovereignty, we ask him to heal, and he says no. I'm not saying that. Because we can't be here forever. And again, there's no lapse in his care for us. Um, I, I, I would say this, though. Um, I think God heals more than, than we, we give him credit. Um, and, and also, cause I, I just don't want to put an undue burden on the sick person, so please hear me. Because there, there's been this thing that's risen up. It's called the Word of Faith movement. That it's completely misunderstood faith, and so they think like faith is intellectual certainty. So I can just convince myself that God's going to do something that means that He's going to. That's nonsense. Um, like like faith is not and to quote Sam Storms. Faith is not you convincing yourself that you believe things that you don't actually believe. All right. No. Like like when you come to biblical faith, let me, let me tell you what biblical faith is. Biblical faith is is uh, directing your need to a person. All right. If you, are, like, if you have the faith to go to Jesus because you believe he can heal you, that is all the faith that you need. Like, can I just, can we just take that off, okay? Like, if, like, like, like biblical, like, faith for healing is, I believe Jesus can heal me. Do I know that he will? I don't, but I know that he can. And by the way, like, like, like think about like when, when the leper comes to Jesus in the gospel and, and, he, and he's like, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Does Jesus go, well, do you think I can or can't? That's not what he does. He says, I'm willing, be clean. All right? 
I just like to bring this up, okay? Because there's been some unhealthy theology taught about healing. Let me, let me tell you one that I ascribed to for a while. Um, that actually, I had a friend graciously break. I haven't even taught it here. You know, for the longest time, I believed that um, in order to see healing, we had to discern whether or not it was God's will to heal and be. And like, no, like, like he's spoken, and so that's when I pray. Um, and, and I remember, like, so where I was last weekend, I, if you can believe this or not, I, w- I was in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Why? I'll tell you. Um, I have a friend who moves, like, really powerfully in healing and, and deliverance, and, and I, I want to do that more. And so I'm like, man, like, like, like what, you know, what do you do, right? Um, he was like, well, it's more caught than taught. So how about you just come with me? Um, when I pray for people, you just hang out, and, and, and I'll just show you what we do, right? And so I was talking with him about this. I, and I mean, like, seriously, I watched four people get healed last weekend. It was awesome, okay? Um, and we were talking about this idea because I, I, I just had this belief, okay, like, you have to know that God's going to. And I told him about, like, a friend who had given me this, this quote, unquote, prophetic word that, that told me that. And he was like, I believe the person was very sincere in their uh, heart towards you, but they're full of it. <laughs> and, 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 he, and he just made this point. He's like, listen, um, who in the Gospels did Jesus turn away when they came to him? Like, that's the heart and person of Christ, right? And so back to this idea of, of Acts 4, okay? Here's the thing that I want you to understand. Here's the translation of the prayer that they're praying. What they're saying is simply this, God, we're scared, but you're not surprised. Let us proclaim your name more. That's Acts 4, and that's beautiful. And look at what happens in verse 31. And after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit again and spoke the word of God boldly. You know why I like that verse? Um, I like that verse because it shows God's generosity. Look, this isn't that long after Pentecost. Like when they were in the upper room and, and there's you know, the breath of God and the tongues of fire. Like if I were God, I'd be like, guys, didn't I just do this? Right? But he sees them where they are. He sees their fear. He sees the real threats. And his heart is so much in love towards them. And he's like, okay, hey, you're scared, but you want to stick with me and you want to proclaim the kingdom? Okay, let's have a refresher. Let's go for it. And I would say that about the Lord. He's generous and he will give you what you need. Like for, for the ones who like me, like, gosh, like I, there's this person on my heart at work and I want to share my faith with them, but I'm so scared of what will happen. And you think God is chastising you for that. No, go to him with your name. Father, you see that I'm scared. Would you give me the right words? Father, you see that I'm scared. Would you, would you give me the boldness to step over my fear? He's not going to swat you for wanting to do the right thing. That's just not who he is. You know, I was reminded of that. Um, look, can I, can I? Okay, I'll just tell you the story. And Greg, we, we can clear that off. We don't need that screen. Um, a couple of weeks ago, um, the Lord put me in a position where, and, and look, this does not happen often. I'm, I'm not a man of influence in any stretch of the imagination, okay? Um, but he put me in the position where I felt like he told me to rebuke a brother in the Lord who's a lot more notable, <laughs> uh, with a lot more respect. Like, like respected and known, and I just, he had some bad theology. And I, I mean, like, when I say, like, like, the Lord told me to rebuke him, I mean, I literally had this, <laughs> sometimes I feel like, I don't know if you ever read the story of Gideon, where, like, he's terrified, like, God, if it's you, would you? You know, that was me. <laughs> like, like, Lord, what do you want me to do? Rebuke him. Okay, well, if that's you, because I, I had, like, a head cold for, like, three days, I'm like, would you heal this head cold? And before I could even say, <laughs> like, before I could even say amen, it was gone. All right. And you would think that would be enough, but I'm not. Like, it wasn't. Like, I'm, I'm still like, I'm like, okay, so go to prayer. All right. Like, oh, God, like, I'm scared. And, uh, right. Um, again, if I were God, I'd be like, get it together, dude. All right. And so I'm, I'm, I'm in my prayer time. And it's, by the way, man, I keep telling you I spend time with Jesus. This is another reason to do it, because this stuff happens when you spend time with it. And I'm in my prayer time. Like, I'm there for like an hour and nothing has happened. 
I'm reading the script, like the scripture's not speaking. I don't feel the presence of God. I haven't heard from the Lord. I'm just like, come on. But I'm so worried about this. Like, ah, all right. No, at that point I had rebuked him and I was worried about the aftermath. That's what it was. Okay, sorry. So, um, and so I go, <laughs> and so I'm about to just, I don't know if you ever have a moment like this where you're just like, I've been praying, I've been praying, I've been praying, nothing's happening. All right, I'm done for the day. Okay. All right. Okay, thank God bless you. Okay. Ryan's honest. The rest of you are liars. So look. Um, all right, so look. So look. Okay. So I, I go to leave my prayer space and I just, and, and you, you, you'll know this the more you spend time with the Lord. I just feel this little tug from the Holy Spirit just a little bit longer. You ever have, like, I'm just a, you know, just wait just a little bit more. And so I'm like, <sighs> so I get, and I sit back down. And, and, and the phrase, 1 Peter 5, 7, just flashes in my mind. I'm like, I don't know what that is. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a preacher. I don't have the Bible memorized. I don't know what that is. And so I open it up. You know what it says? Cast all your anxieties on the Lord, for he cares for you. And I'm like, <sighs> And then I begin to read through, like, because I open my Bible, I sit right there, and like, my, my attention is just drawn to the beginning of the chapter. Hey, elders and overseers of the church, fulfill your duties not because you must, but because you're willing. In other words, hey, like, and I just felt like the Lord just, hey, do you want to do this? Like, if you don't, I, I, I'll give you the yeah, but like, do you want this? And I'm like, yeah. And, and, and as I say, yeah, like, okay, this, this, this is some, some, okay, I'll just say it. Instantly, my, 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 my chest began just to warm up. Like, like just, I mean, I don't, the only framework that I have for it is, like, you know, you can think of in the Gospels where, like, the, the disciples walking with Jesus on the road to Emmaus after he, he leaves, they're like, didn't our hearts burn within us as, as he opened the scriptures to us? Remember that? Or, or if you're Methodist, like my dad, John Wesley, like, my, my, my heart was, like, his heart was strangely warm. I experienced that. And like, I mean, like, I'm so aware that I'm in the presence of God. He's going to minister to me. And I bring this up because um, I did not deserve it. Like, the whole reason I'm in that space is because I don't trust God. But over and over again, he proves to me that he can be trusted. And the same is true for you. Let me just tell you that. Like, listen, we, like, when we talk about worshiping Jesus, it's not that we serve a Jesus who used to exist. And now he's gone. You understand what I'm saying? Like, we serve a Jesus who's very much alive. The Holy Spirit is very much here among us. So why are we so shocked when he acts like it? But we are. And so maybe what we need to do, hey, hey, is pray exactly what they prayed. Lord, we're scared. Lord, you're not surprised. And in fact, you've been bringing us to this moment. So we ask you, stretch out your hand and heal and do signs and wonders through the mighty name of your servant, Jesus. Last week, Pastor Josh made a really good point that I agree with wholeheartedly. I mean, I didn't disagree with any of his message, but like this one particular point. Okay, listen to me. Like, here, here's the reason. He said, listen, I'm not sure that anything short of the miraculous will reach this generation because their hearts are so hard and you can't reason with them about anything. I agree with that sentiment. I think nothing but a supernatural work of God will reach those that the Lord has called us to reach. So here's a crazy idea. If we want to be effective in the gospel, if we want to proclaim the kingdom, how about we ask God to do the kingdom? So let's ask him. And when we're done, like, um, I'm, I'm seriously, like, uh, Josh, you can pop up here. If you've got any ailment in your body, if you're dealing with uh, mental or demonic oppression, we would love to rebuke those things in the name of Jesus. And I believe God is going to do some healing here. Not because of the, the men of God prayed. No, because the Christians prayed. Because that's who Jesus is. I said, every head bowed, every eye closed. Father God, you see us in this moment. And oh, Lord, you are not surprised. Even working us to it. I didn't plan this. This is not where I wanted to take us. And you were like, yeah, actually. And Lord, if you set it up, that means that you've got something in mind that's greater than we could ask for. And so we say yes and amen, Lord Jesus, have your way among us. In the name of Jesus Christ and through the power of his blood, I release gifts of healing among the body now. Brothers, sisters, place your hands on the sick. And watch the Lord heal for the glory of the name of Jesus. So, Lord, 
meet with us in this place and enable us to with all power and fervor proclaim the kingdom of God that is coming Christ. In Jesus' name, we have the privilege of praying. Amen.